If you'd like to turn in your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 26, 27 and 28. You think, goodness me, it's going to be a long sermon. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. <laughs> I want to take something from Paul's life <clears throat> to illustrate the importance of fulfilling the Word of God and the will of God in our lives. Now, we're going to see today, this is a, a sea shanty Sunday. <laughs> I don't know about you, but do you like the sea? I know Malcolm likes the sea. Yeah. Anybody like the sea? Yeah, no, I, I'm sort of half. Yeah, I can only, I can only take it when it's calm. <laughs> I don't like the... <laughs> Yeah. Oh yeah, don't like that, don't want to be shipwrecked. Yeah, and so Paul, if you look at those preceding chapters in ch chapter 24, 25, 26, um, he was going through a bit because the, the Jews had something against him and uh, they were accusing him of making the wrong doctrine, teaching the wrong stuff. And so he had to go before King Agrippa. He was examined by Festus. He was a statesman there, a statesman. And they really couldn't find anything wrong with him. But the Jews still had something against him. And so he thought, the, the only hope I've got is to go to Rome and to appeal before Caesar my case. Now he didn't really want to do it, but he knew he had to, to clear his name. But he knew also it was the will of God for him to go to Rome because God wanted him to preach the gospel to these Roman citizens. And so he had a struggle, and it's always a struggle to fulfill the will of God. You see, Paul had a call on his life. Anybody that's led churches will know that there's constant pullings in the heart. There's opposition from the enemy. The devil, Satan, would always try to prevent you from doing things. There's always trials. And so Paul went through a lot of trials at sea. And we go through, from time to time, storms, don't we? Storms of life that shock us. Sometimes they come up unexpectedly and we're taken off guard. It's surprising how quickly the Sea of Galilee could change from being calm one minute and to a squall, a storm, brewing up the next and we have that illustrated don't we in the, the New Testament with Jesus walking on the water the storm, to storm to calm the storm that his disciples were in in the boat and so here they wanted to go and Paul was looking at the situation and he encouraged them Look, it's not the right time of the year to set off. Now, we all probably, I've never been there, but a lot of people love the Mediterranean because of the sunshine, calm waters. But the Mediterranean can be a very, very dangerous place if you're in it, in the sea, at the wrong time. <laughs> there are winds galore and there are many, many rocks. And remember, in those days, they had a simple structure, all made of wood, not like modern boats today. And, uh, you know, they, were, they didn't have an engine, didn't have any steam, didn't have any nuclear power. And so they were at the mercy of the wind. All they could do is perhaps put the sail down, but that wouldn't really do much because you wouldn't get anywhere, would you? And so there was always a battle on um, when the wind blew up. And so 
he advised them, look, it's not worth put, putting out to sea at the moment. Let, let's just harbour in a still place over winter. Let, let's be practical here. Let's be sensible. Let's just take it easy. We'll get there in the end, he says, but, you know, but, but no, no, the shipment wanted to get going. The owners of the ship wanted to set sail. And so in chapter 27, they, they shouted off of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. They went to another place and uh, they went through Crete and gradually moved around. And we, we come to this part here in the story. They, they passed Fair Havens <laughs> and they shouted off of Crete. Uh, that's verse 7. And uh, they came to verse 14 here. And it's a long word, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Eurachlindon. If you say it quick, it's Eurachlindon. <laughs> Which simply means a northeaster. In actual fact, it was a, a southeast wind that stirs up broad waves. That's in my margin in my Bible. But they call it the Northeaster. Now that was a ferocious storm. And it hit the boat. And, uh, oh dear, it started to break up. Started to get into trouble. And you know, the enemy didn't really want Paul to go to Rome. Because he knew that if he went there, he'd preach the gospel there, and more souls would get saved. And so it was his intention to kill Paul. That's what I believe in this story. To put him in different situations where his life would be lost. Yeah. And that's what the enemy does, I think, at times with us. In different situations. He just wants to shipwreck our lives. So there's a fight on. There's a battle on. And we need to pray. We need to engage in spiritual warfare. And so the next thing we discover in verse uh, 17, apart from this horrible tempest, this raging storm, Eucharist, I'll say it quick. <laughs> um, <laughs> there was not only that, they were in fear of being stuck on a sandbar. You think, well, that's no problem. Well, if you just off of Ramsgate on the, on the south coast of England, there's what you call the Goodwin Sands. Have you ever been there, Malcolm? On a, yeah, yeah, he knows all about it. <laughs> For those that don't know, Malcolm used to be a lighthouse keeper. All right? <laughs> and many, many a, a, a ship has gone down, no doubt, on the Goodwin Sands. So it's, it's quicksands. And they called this place Syrtis. Syrtis Sands, verse 17. I ain't really got the pronunciation very well, but Citrus Sands that struck them, and so they were driven. Now, it, it's not nice, is it, to be caught in sand that's sinking. There used to be a, sing, a, a hymn that we used to sing years and years ago from Sinking Sand, He Lifted Me. Yeah, you know that one? No, no it's a good one. Because God rescues us from sinking sands. I remember when the boys were small, we had a holiday at Burnham. Um, we were pastoring our first church in Droitwich and we had a break. And uh, one day we went out on low tide and we come across this um, horrible sand, muddy sand. And we couldn't get our feet out and we were fighting. And so we were helping the kids to get them out quick and go up and run up the beach on solid sand where we were struggling to try and help one another get our feet out, you know. <laughs> and in the end, we called that 
Boggy Burnham. So it wasn't Burnham by the sea anymore. We're not going to Boggy Burnham again, are we? No, 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 we won't go there anymore. <laughs> Boggy Burnham, yeah, remember it well. <laughs> and so, you know, the sand would try to keep you under. It would try to drag you, try to lock you in, so you can't get anywhere, can't do anything. It's an attack of the enemy, the sinking sand. It holds you up, prevent you from fulfilling the will of God. And so there's two things, the tempest, the sinking sand, and then the next minute, we find they were still in great trouble. The waves were still beating on them. I bet the boat had a good old battering, bits of wood flying here and flying there. But uh, one day, Paul had a word from God. Isn't it great when you have a word from God? Yeah? When you open your Bible, and God speaks to you, and you know it's Him, because it touches your spirit. Yeah, think, oh, thank you, Lord. That's a word from you. Yeah. And so, in verse twenty-three, it says, "There stood by me this night an angel of the Lord, saying, verse twenty-four, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar." And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So Paul says in verse 25, Therefore, just as it was told me, so shall it be. It will be done. So Paul stood upon the word of God. And that is so important that if God <coughs> gives you something from heaven, a word, a prophetic word, then stand on it, because that's God's word to you. This time last year, we had the bad news from the estate agent to say that your landlord wants to sell the house. A year goes quickly, doesn't it? But you, need, you see, we had a, a... Not a word, well it was a word, but we had a lorry pass us on the roundabout before this happened, on our way down to the meeting here at Sandy Hill. A great big lorry. And on the side of this lorry, in white letters, it said, TRUST. And I said to Glenn, that's a word to us from God. Trust. I don't know what we've got to trust him for, but we soon found out. <laughs> Look, no house. I want your house back. We have to trust him, don't we? We have to believe, put our roots down and say, okay, God, you've spoken. Everything's going to be all right. And I think it was the same time when Shirley and John were moving, wasn't it? Yeah, just prior to us. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. And that was a bit of a storm. And so last year in the midst of the heat wave, I mean, we've shivered this year, haven't we, this summer? Yeah. I think I've only put my shorts on once. <laughs> but in the midst of the heat wave, we were packing boxes and doing this and doing that, going down to the tip, etc., etc. <sighs> yeah. So what I'm saying is here, don't give up. If you're finding yourself in a storm, in a battle, the raging wind is contrary to you, then don't give up. Stand upon the Word of God. Mm. Yeah. And then we find that the trial still continues. Verse 27 here, it says, They were driven up and down the Adriatic Sea. Driven. You see, these winds were all over the place. And they lost control of the boat. They were, they were being driven by the wind, driven by the, by the tides, etc., etc. And sometimes we get driven, don't we? 
The enemy tries to drive us into a situation where we just give up and say, no, I've had enough of this, I can't stand anything more of this, and we give up. Some people try to drive us, don't they? You know, they say things to us and we think, oh no, no, that's not right, no, I'm not having any of that. And we have to shut our minds off to sometimes people, good intentional people sometimes, but we say, no, can't accept that. that, that's not God's will. And so it's not very nice to be driven. Yeah. And so Paul comes up to the man and says, look, they've been fasting. I don't know what they've been fasting over. Perhaps it was fasting to get out of this problem of the storm because it, it went on and on and on and on and on. So many days they never saw the moon and they never saw the stars. But they had to keep moving on in the storm. And so Paul encouraged the men, it's time for you to take some food because we need our strength. Now God gave that promise to Paul that not one of them will be lost. All right? So he was standing upon the word of God. Don't give up. Yeah. Have some food. Get strengthened. And then we find in verse 46 that they were getting nearer to land. Because they put the old uh, plumb line down and said, 14 fathoms, Captain. Twelve fathoms, Captain. Five fathoms, Captain. How was he doing this, Captain? He's leading us on the beach. <laughs> but that was what was happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then they came to where it says there were two seas that met. Now, there's always trouble when there's two seas. Sometimes on an estuary, you go out the estuary and you hit the main sea and you might be nice and calm on the boat. And I remember a trip, I don't know where we were, I think it was, might have been Plymouth or Portsmouth. We had a trip when I was a youngster up the dark valley uh, estuary. And oh dear, the tide and the wind was contrary and the poor little boat was only a little pleasure boat. It was going all over the place. And uh, people were sick and people were really ill. And then when we turned the corner to go up the estuary, it all became calm. So when there's cold water hitting warmer water, and when the tide's in the wrong place at the wrong time, there are problems. Yeah? And so, these two seas met. Tide has a big part to play if you're a, a mariner. Being in the wrong place at the wrong time. The Manoi Straits is noted for its severe tides, one of the most dangerous parts in uh, the British Isles, going along the Menai Straits, yeah? Uh, there are many other places as well. Strong tides that will knock you off course. There are tides in life <clears throat> that will tend to knock you off course. And you think, help, what do I do? Just go with the tide? Put the anchor down? No, I think you just go round and round and round in circles if you put the anchor down. You just have to pray to God, get me out of this situation. There's riptides. A lot of people at Freshwater West have died over the years because they've gone into the sea and they haven't been aware of the riptides that are there in that dangerous part of the beach. They've gone out with their boards and then lost control because the riptide has just taken them out. And you can't fight a strong riptide. You just have to go with the flow. And many have lost their lives. And if you go to Freshwater West, you'll see where the old uh, refreshment place van is. There's little crosses. Ever seen them on the side? 
number of little crosses where people have planted loved ones because their lives have been lost. So tides and root tides can be very, very dangerous. And you see, it's what's under the surface sometimes <coughs> we don't always see. And this is where we need to put our revelationary glasses on. We need to ask God, when we're in a, 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 a trial and a storm, Lord, what in earth is going on? What's all this about? Lord, show me the key to get out of it. Yeah, what's going on under the surface? Because you see, Satan is very, very deceptive. He will do anything to pull you in the wrong direction. And so it's important not to get caught up in deception. Hmm. Here the ship remained unmovable. The stern was being broken up. Some jumped into the sea and swam to this land. They didn't know where they were. It probably still dark. Some jumped off, it says, and they cling to some of the wood and the planks of the boat which was, you know, breaking up on the rocks. But thankfully, they came to shore. Isn't that wonderful? When you set foot on shore, verse 44, it says, they all <coughs> escaped safety to the land. Isn't that wonderful? When that takes place. Well, God had given that promise to Paul, didn't he? Already. He said, you're going to be safe. There's not one of you going to be lost. <laughs> that was the word of the Lord. Yeah. yeah. And so they went on to this island, and the Bible says it was the island of Malta. Anybody been to Malta? Well, I haven't. Yeah. Several times over my life I thought, hmm, I'd like to go to Malta see what happened with Paul there and get a sense of, you know, what's happening on the island. Yeah. And they discovered that the natives were very friendly. They welcomed them. You know, they weren't cannibals ready to gobble them up. <laughs> and so they lit a fire to dry off their clothes. That's good, isn't it? And we come across a, a situation here where Paul started to help and he picked up some sticks to help them build the fire and all of a sudden a viper gripped on his hand and all the islanders thought, uh-uh, he'd be down, he'd be dropping down dead in a minute. <laughs> you see, it was another attack from the enemy, Satan, to try and stop Paul from going to Rome. That was his destiny. But the enemy didn't want him to go there. And so what did he do? He just shook off the creature into the fire. And they thought, hmm, wow, he must be a god after all. <laughs> He's not dead. The viper should have uh, bitten him and the poison should be going round his body and hitting his heart and he should be dying. But no, God protected Paul. He shook it off. Hmm. And so that was another step forward to go to Rome but you see God uses every situation doesn't he what looks bleak sometimes works out for the favour of God to be experienced and here Paul was always ready wasn't he to pray with people to give a word in season and there was this chap he was dying, he had fever, and he had a bit of dysentery, and Paul laid his hands on him, and he got healed. Isn't that great? This is within the course of just carrying on, serving God. He was in the will of God. Yeah. Wherever you are, you can still serve God, even if it might not be the right place, you can still serve the Lord. There's something in that we've got to always learn. Wherever God places, places us, I don't want to be here, but he can still use us because he's still God. 
And the Holy Spirit is still the Holy Spirit that we've received. Yeah? Mm. And then a few other people there on the island heard what had happened to this chap who got healed. And so verse 9, in chapter 28 now, I'm in chapter 28, nearly coming to the end. Many others came with their sicknesses and they found that Paul prayed for them and they all got healed. Mm. And I came to the point in verse 14. So we went toward Rome. In other words, their encounter at Malta only lasted for a, a bit. Natives gave them food and they found another boat going from water and so they headed to Rome. Paul explained to the people there why he'd come to Rome. He'd come towards Caesar to present his case because the Jews were against him. That was his purpose. But you see, when he was there, he still carried on preaching the gospel, didn't he? Verse 14, it says, so they went toward Rome, and in verse 28, it says, therefore, let it be known to you to preach the gospel, I got that wrong, therefore let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. So he was there to preach the gospel to these Romans who were Gentiles, Gentile believers. And so, coming to the end, it says in verse 31, preaching the kingdom of God, teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. So he had got to the place where he had meant to be. That was the call of God on his life. He came to the place at Rome and he presented his case eventually to Caesar. And that's what we've got to do all the time. We've got to keep going. Knowing what God wants us to do, despite all the battles, all the hold-ups, all the shipwrecks, all the houses you might lose, you've got to keep going and trust in God. You see, one of the things that Paul did later on, when he was put in prison, he wrote a letter to the Romans and the, the book of Romans is one of the mighty letters, profound in its uh, writing and its doctrine. It brings forth a lot of doctrinal words that we can read concerning the faith of Jesus Christ. And then eventually, Paul <coughs> got crucified when he was at Rome. But, you see, that was in the course of serving Jesus. Jesus said, they hated me, they're going to hate you. They persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And so he just carried on, because he knew the call of God. He knew he had, what he had to do. And so, dear friends, as we come to the end, you might be in a battle. <clears throat> keep trusting in God. Keep praying. Keep letting God know how you feel and God will see you through you might see a deliverance you might see a mighty breakthrough but keep going on until God works it out and he will work it out but he'll work it out his way might not necessarily be our way you see the Bible says our ways are not God's ways and God's ways are not our ways so we just have to trust him. Okay? Right. Can we pray now? Yeah. Lord, we find this very sobering message because all we wanted Paul to be hunky-dory. We wanted him to be happy. 
We wanted him to be praising the Lord. But we find, Lord, there that in his life he had trials and temptations, just like we do. But we thank you, Lord, that you gave him the victory. And all he got through it. And he fulfilled his mission and went to Rome. And so with us, Lord, will you help us? Help us, Lord, to combat the powers of darkness when they attack. Give us wisdom in our warfare that we might apply ourselves to you and to trust you. And to be thankful, Lord, that you will always see us through. You will always help us. There is always another.